William Carey, an open Bible and an open map in mission. So you're turning to Isaiah 49, and as you're turning there, I want you to look at a few pictures with me on the screen. You're going to see some indigenous people groups, whether you find them in the streets of Pensacola or in London or in Southeast Asia or in the Middle East. It's amazing when you start looking at faces, and in particular, you look at eyes and you see these people that God made in His own image. God made in His likeness, according to Genesis chapter 1. And some of them look very different than you, and they look very different than me, and some of them, of course, are practicing very different religions and have very different customs and very different dietary uh, customs. But these are people made in God's image. Some are young, some are old, some are devoted to things we would say are not very helpful to their souls. In fact, are being led astray. And as you're in Isaiah 49, I want to ask you this question. Do these people matter to God? Does the gospel that we believe in as a church have anything to do with those faces you just looked at? We're going to start in a tiny little hamlet in England today, and we're going to go all the way to India. So on this Reformation Sunday, let me ask you, the over one billion people in India, do they matter to God? Well, we want to answer that today, and I want God to work in our hearts as we think about the power of the gospel and how God used a man like William Carey. So you're in Isaiah 49. There are four what are called servant songs in the book of Isaiah. These are songs where we hear either God speak to His people or the people of God sing to Him. But this particular song in the prophet Isaiah is very unique. One of the Puritan writers, Thomas Goodwin, said that this section we are about to read today is like we are eavesdropping on a conversation in heaven from eternity past. Meaning this is not a conversation that happened in Isaiah's day. Isaiah gets to listen to this song this conversation, and then he gets to record it for us. We get to hear God the Father and God the Son speak together from before eternity. There's this beautiful section in the Chronicles of Narnia where C.S. Lewis describes the creation of the world. In Aslan, the, the great lion, he sings the world into existence. And I think he gets this idea from the book of Isaiah where we see God the Father and the Son almost singing, if you will, in a poetic way, speaking about you and me. This is what we call God's eternal covenant, His covenant of salvation and redemption. God will save a broken world. So hear with me these truths. We'll start at verses 1 and 2. Scripture says, listen, O coastlands, to me. This is Jesus speaking in eternity. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. From the matrix of my mother, He has made mention of my name. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of His hand, He has hidden me. He has made me a polished shaft. In His quiver... He has hidden me. Now, Isaiah is recording this song for the people of Israel. And we're listening in on this conversation between God the Son and God the Father in eternity. And he begins by speaking not to Israel. He's speaking to the coastlands, to the people that are far away from the ethnic Jews of Israel. In other words, this is not a message just simply for the Jewish people. This is a message God's heart from eternity was for the peoples of the world. Jesus says to his father, you called me from the womb, from the inward parts of my mother. In other words, Jesus, when he came into this world, he's coming as a man. He's coming as a human. He's born of a woman. He's not a nation. Our salvation is not found in a nation. It's found in a man, a person who would be of the seed of Eve, of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, from the city of Bethlehem, born of the Virgin Mary. This is our Savior. 
He says in verse 2, his mouth is like a sharp sword. Jesus is coming to conquer the world, but he's not coming with a physical sword. You see, the power is in his word. What a beautiful figure. See, the power as the church is not in a physical sword. It is in the word of God. That's how lives are changed. You read this here and you see that the word of God is the, is the message of God and the medium that God uses to change the world. Think in the beginning, how did God reveal himself verbally? God said, let there be light. God said it is good. God speaks the world into existence. Jesus is called the what? In the beginning was the, the Word. The Word was with God in eternity. That's what we're reading here. The Word was God. Go to the end of the Bible in Revelation 19, and we see Jesus returning to the earth. And it says he has a sharp sword in his mouth. Now, that's not a literal sword. Again, this is an image that it's by the power of his word. As we sang in that hymn, one little word shall fell the devil. We'll stop him. The power is in the word of God. What a beautiful figure. We also see here that the shadow of the father's hand has hidden him. You see, before Jesus came into the world 2000 years ago, he was hidden in the father. Jesus has always been God from eternity. Before time began, Jesus existed as eternal God. He was hidden with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit in the Trinity. He was revealed to us at the right time. He is eternally God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through Him all things were made. This is Jesus. This is deep and beautiful, yes. And it goes on, look at verses 3 and 4. Now God responds to Jesus. The Father says to the Son, He said to me, You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I, Jesus said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord, with Yahweh. My work is with my God. I want you to notice here the intimate relationship between the Father and the Son. Jesus is the servant. He is the one who will save His people. God the Father is offering Jesus Israel. He's saying, Jesus, I'm going to give you a people, the nation of Israel. You can save them. But here, Jesus is not satisfied with simply the Jews. Thomas Goodwin, again, as he comments, the Puritan writer, says Jesus demands a greater payment. Jesus says, if it's just the Jews, I've labored in vain. Remember how the Gospel of John begins. Jesus came unto his own people, and his own people what? They did not receive him. Instead, they said, crucify him, crucify him. He's saying here, look, it is not enough for me to be despised and rejected simply for one ethnic people group. So God responds to Jesus in his mercy. God says, okay, the gospel will not simply be for the Jew. Look at verses 5 through 7. Now, Yahweh says, the Father says back to the Son, who formed me from the womb to be his servant? He formed me to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel will be gathered to him. Jesus says, I will be glorious in the eyes of Yahweh. God, my God, will be my strength. In other words, Jesus will live the perfect life you and I could never live. He will live the life that will please God for us. Verse 6, indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you would be my servant to just raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. Notice, I will give you Jesus as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to where? The ends of the earth. To the billion people in India. To the billions of people in Southeast Asia. To the millions of people in South America. To the peoples in Antarctica. To the peoples in the South Pole. Well, I don't know about that, but you know, everywhere, right? I don't know how many people are down there, but everywhere, right? God is saving people through Christ. Thus says the Lord, verse 7, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to Him who man despises, to whom whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers. Jesus, kings will see and arise. Princes will worship because of Yahweh who is faithful, because of the Holy One, that's Jesus of Israel. He 
has chosen you to do this. How beautiful that God chose. Remember, we're so American, ethnocentric. We think the gospel is all about us. Listen, we at one time were the ends of the earth. America is full of the ends of the earth. And the world has many all throughout that are the ends of the earth where the gospel will go. So today we look at one great reformer in the life of William Carey, a man who believed Isaiah 49 and he lived it. Why study William Carey? Why think about this great man of God and how he relates to Isaiah 49? Well, first off, William Carey is the founder of the modern mission movement. He was India's first cultural anthropologist. He gave 72 years of his life to the faithful work of the gospel. William Carey translated the complete Bible by himself in six different languages portions of it into 29 other languages, meaning there was people that had no copy of God's word, and then they got a full Bible through one man giving his life for Christ. Think about that. 29 languages, six full complete languages he gave the Bible in. He was used of God to see millions come to Christ directly and indirectly. In fact, one Indian writer has said this about William Carey, and I want you to think about this and ask yourself, how do I look at my city of Pensacola? How do I look at the peoples that live in my city, the different people groups that live in my city? William Carey saw India not as a foreign country to be exploited, but as his heavenly father's land to be loved and to be saved. In other words, do you use people or do you love people? He believed in understanding and controlling nature instead of fearing appeasing or worshiping it like the tribal superstitions in developing one's intellect instead of killing your mind as mysticism taught he emphasized enjoying literature and culture instead of shunning it as maya which is the supernatural power in hinduism wielded by the demons and such to produce illusions what if we saw pensacola as a place to love and to reach with the gospel what if we didn't just say this is our home and our city, but these are people that matter to God all around me? Well, I'd say to you, every one of us would be here this Wednesday night. I'd say to you that we would be active in sharing our faith and we would be lights for Jesus everywhere we go, not just on Sunday morning at 1030. That's what would happen. So we're going to go back in time over 250 years. So the year is 1761. In that year, John Wesley is 58 years of age, preaching the gospel to the Methodists. And in that year, George Whitfield is making a trip across the Atlantic Ocean to be a missionary in this country. And he was on his sixth trip, coming from the old England to New England here. It was in that year that crowds were filling up Westminster Abbey to listen to Handel's Messiah live with George Frederick Handel. What a time it was. William Carey is born in the year 1761, August 17th. He's born in a very little hamlet, a little village of Pollers Perry in Northamptonshire in England. His father was a weaver when he was born, and later um, he became a schoolmaster of a very small uh, village school there in Pollers Perry. And he had pretty humble beginnings. It's important to note, though, that his father was a schoolmaster because God's going to use that in his life. You see, there was a newspaper called the Northampton Mercury. It was one of the earliest weekly newspapers in England. And when this newspaper was printed, only three people in the town would get a copy of it. Of course, the town ruler, the, um, the town clergy, and then also the schoolmaster. And everyone would have to wait to be able to read about what was going on in England and going around in the world. It was like uh, maybe for some of you who are older, everyone gathering around the radio or uh, today, everyone watching the modern news, except for this is all you got was the newspaper once a week. And half of you couldn't even read it. So you needed the town pastor or the, the politician or the schoolmaster to read it aloud to you. Now, why do I bring this up? Because William's father was reading these articles to this young man and he was hearing about the slave trade. He was hearing about the controversy that was going on as they were debating whether the slave trade should continue or not, and whether these Africans and these East Indian people were made in the image of God, or should they be treated uh, as, as cattle of livestock? What a horrendous thing. And as a young boy, William Carey's hearing these stories, and it's gripping his heart. 
And he's learning about Captain Cook and, and his discoveries to new lands. They're in the newspaper. And William Carey's mind is so excited. We know that William Carey um, one day picked up a book. It was a botany book. And he starts reading about plants. And William Carey was fascinated with plants. And his father is the schoolmaster. But he can't read these words about these plants because they're all written in Latin. And he doesn't know Latin. So as a young man, um, he runs into a person in the village named Mr. Jones, and he shows him the book, and Mr. Jones explains, the reason why, William, you don't understand this, is because it's Latin. Would you like to learn Latin? William Carey says, yes, I would like to learn Latin. And so as this little boy, children in the room, he begins to learn Latin at this young age. Now, a lot of people, and I want all the students in the room to listen to this, all right? A lot of us in this room tend to uh, make light of wisdom and using our minds for God's glory. And uh, we often make light of the nerds among us, which I consider myself one, and that's okay. And it's really sad. As William carries this young man, and he's trying to learn Latin, and he wants to learn about plants, and he's kind of geeking out. Um, whenever his friends would see him come by, they would laugh and say, oh, there goes Columbus off on another one of his adventures. And they would mock William Carey because he was using his mind for good. Now, students, I want you to hear this verse from Proverbs 1. Proverbs was written to you students, and it says, How long, O oh, you simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will you scoffers delight in scoffing and be a fool and hate knowledge? The Bible tells us we are to love God with all of our minds, right? We should not mock those who love God with their minds. We should all be using our minds to know God better. So, so Carrie is a young man, he's getting mocked, he's getting picked on, he's kind of nerding out, which is, which is good. And he desires to work in agriculture because he loves plants. So he gets out uh, after he finishes his time in the little village school. He goes out to begin working in the fields, but he finds that he has very sensitive skin and it begins to break out. So he can't work in the fields like he initially planned and be a botanist. So instead, uh, his parents get him hooked up with a shoemaker and he becomes an apprentice with a shoemaker. Now, this is very important in William Carey's story. Because as he's an apprentice to the shoemaker and he's making shoes, he meets a man named John War. Now, John War was not a member of the Church of England. He was a member of a church that was called the Dissenters. These were the ones who followed the Puritans. They thought that there was too much superstition in the Church of England and that people needed to read the Bible for themselves and have personal faith in Jesus Christ. And listen to this. John War begins to witness to this young man named William Carey. And he begins to share the gospel with him every day. And I want to say to you today, church, your mission field is Monday through Friday. And you never know the person you might share your faith with, what God might do with them. We are commanded to be about this. And John War is witnessing to William Carey. And John War's church... Um, decides to have a special prayer service. The year was 1779. There's a national crisis. And guess what's going on in 1779? A war with those rebel Americans. Okay? And the King of England calls for a day of prayer. And so these dissenters have a day of prayer. And William Carey John, joins John War to go to a day of prayer. I hope you love praying. We as a church need to get together more just to pray together. And so they get together and they're praying together about this. And one of the members reads the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse 13, where it says there, this is a weird verse, but God used it. It just shows us the power of the word. It says, let us go forth, therefore, unto him, unto Jesus, without the camp, bearing his reproach. William Carey read this that day. That was just to wake you up. Um, William Carey read this that day. And guess what happened? He said, I haven't borne the reproach of Christ. I haven't, I haven't repented of my sins. I've been a member of the Church of England, but I've not been a member of God's church. I've never realized the, the weight of my sins and the glory of Jesus. And so that day in a prayer meeting, praying that England would beat us rebels in the United States, William Carey received Jesus Christ as a Lord. And his life was changed. Isn't that amazing? Maybe we went to war and became independent just so William Carey could become a Christian. God works in mysterious ways. You'll know why I say that in a minute. Now, ten, ten years pass by. William Carey is growing in his faith. 
And he begins to witness to his family. Some of us in this room, we have non-saved family members. Our hearts should be burdened for them. So he begins to take any chance he has to pray with his family, pray with his brothers and sisters, pray with his parents. And listen, it was not easy. It took 10 years. But after 10 years, every member of William Carey's family had trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord. He wrote these words about religion compared to true Christianity. He said, religion is far from being a dry and formal round of mere externals. When we pray, it is to the Almighty Governor of heaven and earth. When we hear a sermon, we are responsible for it for eternity. The following thought, we are accountable immortals. In other words, we live forever. Should on all occasions possess our minds. How shall we live? Beautiful. That's the gospel. We are for eternity. So what we do today matters for eternity. And he led his whole family to Christ. Well, William Carey soon met a shy country maiden with very little education by the name of Dorothy. Now, William Carey is a brainiac, and he's learning languages, and he's reading books. And he meets this young lady named Dorothy, and he loves her gentle, shy nature. And one Sunday evening, he felt led of God to ask the most important question in his mind. He said, Dorothy... Will you marry me? And Dorothy said to William, Oh, William, are you sure you want to marry me? I'm not a scholar, and your books don't speak to me as they do to you. I can't even read those books. Gently, he turned to her and said, But Dorothy, do you love me? And she said, Yes, William, I do love you dearly. He held her close and he said, Then that is enough. Perhaps I couldn't teach the love to grow in your heart were it not there already. But I can teach you how to read, Dorothy. I can and I will. You shall see. Twenty years old, married June 1781. By the way, I want to say it again some of you young people in the room. It is far better if you can find a Christian young and let marriage be the foundation stone of your adult life rather than the capstone of your adult life. Now, sometimes God has different plans in our lives, and that's okay. But what a joy it is if God would allow you to be married young and experience life together with Christ if you're prepared. So, this is a beautiful thing. Now, I want you to understand, life was not easy for these two. He and Dorothy had their first hardship when their two-year-old child died. And they were gathered in grief because fever took her life Fever also struck William's body very bad, leaving him a legacy of weariness and a distressing cough the rest of his life. And then his employer, that shoemaker who had employed William, died from the fever. It's a very hard season. And so William, by himself, had to carry this business. He suffered just in the beginning as a young man in his early 20s, yet he did not waste his suffering as a shoemaker. 2 Corinthians says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercy, the God of all comfort. He comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the same comfort we ourselves received when we're comforted by God. William Carey begins to have, as he's learning through suffering in his early 20s, he begins to learn to empathize and have compassion on others and to love others, and to reach others, and to serve others. It's a beautiful thing. So, let's talk about young William's faith. He, uh, we know, had John Wesley come through his little neighborhood. Surely heard the great Wesley preach. He becomes a great student of the Bible. And through his study of the Bible, he realizes that the infant baptism he received in the Church of England was not sufficient. He studies passages like Acts chapter 8 where it says, when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. He becomes convicted that he had been baptized before he believed. And so he finds out a well-known Baptist preacher. And there weren't a lot of Baptists in England at that time, but there were some. And he finds this man named John Ryland Sr. And he shares with him that he needs to be baptized. And on October 5th, 1783, William Carey is baptized. Now, he immediately gets busy for God after his baptism. He applies to join a church near his home, and he soon wants to preach the gospel. He knows that he needs to preach the gospel. Now, understand, William Carey, that's not William Carey, that's John Ryland Sr., but William Carey um, was not the best-looking guy in the room, okay? He was a man 
who was uh, short of build, prematurely bald. He's only in his 20s, and he doesn't have real great speech. He's not a, he's not a well-polished politician, okay? So he's so unimpressive as he applies to be ordained to the ministry and preach the gospel that the church refuses to hear him. In fact, one person who listened to his sermon said his sermon was as weak and crude as anything ever called a sermon. It's pretty rough for the guy who becomes the founder of modern missions. But I want to remind you of what they said about the Apostle Paul. Some of you in the room are like Moses. You say you're slow of speech. And I want to say to you that God can use us in spite of our weaknesses. William Carey had a hard time preaching and speaking. They said of Paul, the Apostle, his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. That means he's not well polished. Maybe he was a little tongue-tied, okay? God can take our weakness and use it for His glory. He doesn't say that you have to be the most eloquent speaker, but you do got to open your mouth. you got to open your mouth. So finally, he applies again to be ordained. And on August 10th, 1786, William Carey is accepted to preach. And notice, this is what his ordination certificate said, wherever God and His providence might call him. It's a very telling statement because we never know where God's going to have us. I can tell you, uh, as a 17-year-old in Bible college, I had no idea I was going to end up in Florida one day. That was not in the books. That was not in the plans. And I want to say to you, we never know where God might be calling us and what God might be up to in our lives. So, William Carey gets his first pastorate. And he's tri-vocational. The poor little church he's called to in Moulton can't even afford to really support him. So he becomes not only a pastor, but he's still a shoemaker. And he also accepts a job as a schoolmaster to pay the bills and support his little family. And as this is going on, he's reading about the life of the Reverend David Brainerd, who was a missionary to the American Indians in New Jersey here in the United States. And he's reading about Captain Cook and his travels all throughout the world. And as he reads these things, he's hearing his Macedonia call, Acts 16, come over and help us. He could hear the people in these stories crying out for help and no one had went to share the gospel. Are there people in your businesses that are crying out, they need hope and no one has shared the gospel with them yet? Are there people on your street that have not heard the gospel yet? William Carey could hear their voices. One day he was teaching his students about the world. And he in particular uh, saw an advertisement for a world globe in the Northampton Mercury newspaper. But he was so poor he couldn't afford to buy a globe for his students. So listen to this. He gets a soccer ball. This is what you call uh, poor man education. He gets a soccer ball and he gets a, a marker or a a, uh, some lead, and he starts drawing out the nations of the world on a soccer ball, okay? And he's showing his students the world on this makeshift soccer ball globe. And I hope you students never look at a basketball or a soccer ball the same again. Remember the peoples of the world when you see that thing. And as he's talking to his students, he begins crying as he's holding that soccer ball. And he says, these people have never heard the gospel of saving grace. You see, William Carey told them, to know the will of God, we need an open Bible and we need an open map and be prepared to go wherever God and His sovereign providence would send us. Now, he says these words to God on that day, here I am, Lord, send me which are dangerous and wonderful words that we all need to be willing to say every single day. Here I am, Lord. Send me. It's not enough for Sunday morning. Send me where you want me to go this day. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to backtrack for a minute. I want to go back 13 years before William Carey was born. I want to go to the year 1748, okay? There was a theologian in Boston, Massachusetts by the name of Jonathan Edwards. And he was asked by Scottish ministers to write a booklet on prayer. And so he wrote this book. I want to show you it. Notice this title. This is how they, they used to know how to write titles. A humble attempt to promote explicit agreement and visible union in God's people in extraordinary prayer. No one would buy that book today, okay? But that was the title of this book. And it was a book about praying as a church together and praying for the nations. Now, Edwards wrote this book in 1748. It was read by a pastor in the little town of Olney, England in 1784. 
And here's the amazing thing. Um, this pastor, it was actually the year after William Carey was baptized, this pastor read this volume. And so for the next 10 years, his congregation and other ministers began to gather every Monday to pray for the revival of churches and the spread of the gospel. 10 years they prayed, believing God would do a sovereign work in their hearts. William Carey said, if it wasn't for these pastors praying, I never could have got to the billion people in India that needed the gospel. God does not waste your prayers. Hear this, brothers and sisters. He does not. Now, here's the thing. Carey says, prayer, secret, fervent, believing prayer is the root of all personal godliness. So William Carey, uh, one day, is meeting with a bunch of pastors and he is given the opportunity to ask any question to the older ministers. So his question is this. He asks, if the Great Commission of Jesus made it obligatory for the gospel, not just to stay in England, but to spread throughout all the nations. We are told that one of the ministers, Dr. Ryland, an older man, said to William, young man, sit down. When God wants to convert the heathen, He will do it without your aid or without mine. Sounds pretty cruel, huh? Let me give you a modern translation. Why are we helping other nations? We've got enough problems here in the United States. Why are we feeding the poor? There's enough hungry people in our street. Why are we being generous to these people down at the mission? We should be taking care of more people in our congregation. The list could go on and on, right? Well, I've heard more excuses than that. Those are just the modern versions of this. In other words, we don't need to do anything. We can just pray and let God handle it. Well, God is sovereign to change people's life, but God doesn't just ordain the ends. He ordains the means to the ends, and He wants to use me, you and me for His mission. So this pastor was wrong. Just because there's age doesn't mean there's always wisdom. He was wrong. Now, William Carey decides that he is going to study what the Bible teaches about missions because he wants to share this good news with others. And so he writes a book with a much shorter title than Jonathan Edwards, though still long, An Inquiry into the Obligation of Christians for the Conversion of the Heathens. And he begins with a study of the Great Commission, Matthew 28. I've got it up there in King James. This is what uh, the translation was back then. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, or make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, or behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, the end of the world. Amen. Now, what was Jesus meaning when he gave that great commission? Did he actually mean for us today to go, or was that just for the apostles? Was that just for those early Christians? Well, William Carey answered this very well in his pamphlet. He said, if the command of Jesus to teach all nations is only for the apostles, then the promise of his presence, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world, must also be limited only to the apostles. But this is worded in such a way to surely stop us from having that idea. I am with you all always. Aren't you glad God's with us every day? Every day He's with us in this work. Even to the end of our lives and the end of this world, He'll be with us. And then William Carey used the examples throughout church history. In fact, he quoted the church father, Tertullian, who talked about uh, Old Britain, England, right? He said that the Roman armies could never conquer the British. But when Christians went to England with the gospel, they conquered England. Not with swords. What did Jesus say? His mouth is a sword, right? With the word of God, those people were changed forever. It is the power of the gospel that changes nations and changes cultures and changes families and changes hearts like yours and mine. It's the power of God's word. So William Carey made this great argument here. Now, his church is growing. Um, God is doing a great work. He actually had to revoke the membership of every member of his church. Because there were many people that had made professions of faith and were not possessors of Jesus. And he kind of replanted the church from the beginning up. Amazing thing. And he survived that, which is a double amazing thing. Because there's nothing like taking away a Baptist membership to get them riled up. But they weren't Christians. 
And so, William Carey um, has an opportunity to preach before a bunch of ministers on May 31st. And he goes and he preaches from Isaiah 54. And Isaiah 54 is another one of these songs of the prophet Isaiah. And you notice here, this is the song that says that the, the woman who's barren should sing. She should sing. It's a picture of a widow whose husband has been carried away into Babylon, and she's sitting in dust and ashes. She's crying, and God's telling her, stop crying, stop mourning. I want you to sing. I am going to enlarge your tent. I'm going to enlarge where you live. In other words, you're not going to stay in mourning forever. The gospel, the good news, the light of the world is going to spread far beyond you. Again, he preached it from the King James, and that's what I've got it in. And you will break forth on the right and the left, and the Gentiles will have the gospel. And he's preaching this to them, and he preaches this great sermon, and he says, listen, church ministers, we don't go in our own strength. We go in the power of God, in the strength of God, the Holy One of Israel. We do not just go to the Baptists of Pensacola. We must go to the nations of the world, like our team that's going to Guatemala soon. And maybe some of you will come with me to Colombia one day, and wherever else God calls us, we're going to be going uh, in just a few weeks. As Brother Bill said, we're going to go down uh, to Panama City and we're going to share the gospel and help those in need on a short-term mission trip for a day. Wherever God calls us to go, God will be successful in doing His work. Well, listen to this. After he was finished pre preaching, the, the moderator, who was a great minister named Andrew Fuller, was about to close the meeting and have everyone leave the service after the sermon, as we always do. But William Carey reached over and he grabbed Andrew Fuller's arm. And he said, Is nothing again to be done, sir? Is nothing again to be done? Will we not go to the nations? Well, this was not exactly a response you could ignore. So what did they do? Well, Andrew Fuller said, Let's appoint a committee to study this issue. That's a good Baptist way to kill an idea. Just appoint a committee. Well, they thought this will calm down our overzealous pastor brother, William Carey. Well, guess what? It did not. William Carey pushed and pushed until finally they brought together the first missionary society, the particular Baptist Reform Society for the propagation of the gospel among the heathen. They liked long titles. William Carey said in that sermon these words, expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. We should live that every single day. Expect that God can do great things. I believe, listen, students in this room, you guys that are under 18 in here, God can do great things in your lives. God can use you far greater than He's used any of us adults in this room. And for some of you adults, you need to hear God's not done. He's not done. If you're still alive and breathing, He can do more in you than He's done ever before. Expect an attempt great things for God. Well, friends, he appoints this missionary society, this particular society, this beautiful uh, reformed movement of Christians that believe in God's power and his grace to the nations. And he begins to meet with a missionary named Dr. Thomas. And Dr. Thomas is going to go to India. And William Carey hears these stories about supporting uh, Dr. Thomas in India and William Carey is so gripped in his heart, he knows he's got to go with him. He cannot just send off this one missionary. He needs to go. So he goes home to his dear wife, and he tells Dorothy his plans and desire for her and the children to go to India. Now understand, they haven't hardly left but their little village their whole lives. There's no, there's no cars back then, right? There's no planes. Like, people don't travel that far. And she says, William, we cannot go. Think of our children. She's actually pregnant with a child at this time. Think of your church here in your home. God wouldn't want you to leave everything. She's pregnant with their fourth son. He says, my dear, you don't understand. I know God has asked me to go to India for him. He has called me. I cannot draw back and I would not if I could. Other ministers tried to talk her into going without any success. So... William wrote a letter to his father to explain that he was going. He said, I have made, I have many sacrifices to make ahead. I must part with my beloved family and a number of my most affectionate friends, but I have my hand to the plow. And when his father got this letter, he said, William is crazy. 
He's lost his mind. So plans were made for William to take his oldest son, Felix, with him and that his wife would come and join him a year later. So William and Dr. Thomas and Felix, they found a ship that was crazy enough to take these two Brits all the way to India with them, not as salespersons, but as missionaries, which was, by the way, an illegal activity. So that's why it was kind of a stretch. Well, guess what? This captain of the ship got cold feet, and he decided that there was no way he was going to take these two missionaries and take the chance of getting in trouble going to India with them. So William and Dr. Thomas were devastated. So they get back to, to England after traveling a short distance. And here's the amazing thing, all right? William realizes what date it is. His wife is about to have that fourth child. So he finds way to get back home, and he literally gets there as she's having the fourth child. She's just had him. And the next day, he says to his wife, my dear, please reconsider. He prays with her. Please come with us. We found another boat. It leaves tomorrow. Will you come? And she says, I'll only go if my sister will go with me. Her sister was living with her to help. And by the providence and power of God, the sister says, I'll go. I'll go. And so imagine this. A woman, I just want you to hear about a woman of faith, okay? She's never left but her little village and her original village of birth. And in less than 24 hours, she's got to get all four kids together. She's got to pack the whole house up. And they need to leave to go to the other end of the world, India. Not on an airplane, all right? Not by automobile, but by a boat that's going to take six months. And she says yes to the Lord. And she goes with her husband. That's the providence of God and the power of God in the gospel. Now, five months voyage, almost six to get total. And on that voyage, they begin to learn the Bengali language. And William Carey, he learns enough of the Bengali language while he's traveling on boat to translate almost the whole book of Genesis for the first time ever into the language of the people. Now I want you to understand, they arrive on the shores of India. This is their first and only trip to India. They will never go back home to England. The next 40 years of their lives will be in India. No vacation, no furlough, no break. 40 years with the people in a foreign land. How amazing is this? He spends the rest of his life as a pastor, a linguist, an agriculturalist, a journalist, a botanist, a social activist, a statesman, but most importantly, an evangelist of the gospel. Now, William Carey and Thomas grossly underestimated what it was going to cost to live in India. All right? They had no idea how expensive it was going to be. And the money that was being sent from England was pitiful. So they had to get secular jobs while they were learning the languages and doing the work of the ministry. William Carey said, I am a stranger in a strange land. I have no Christian friend. I have a large family and nothing to supply their needs. But I have God and his word is sure. In fact, he made this great statement. It's a beautiful one. The future is as bright as... That's the promises of God. And he knew God would provide for them. And so for 40 years, he's going to give his life to these stranger people. He first comes into a city of 200,000 people. He was in a village of just a few hundred before. And now 200,000 people who are pagans. He said preachers are needed a thousand times more than people to preach to. Just a few Christians among 200,000 people. He saw things that broke his heart, brothers and sisters. People practicing self-torture by hook swinging. For this ceremony, hooks were fastened into the flesh on either side of a man's back. Strings were attached to the hooks, tied to ropes at the end of a horizontal bamboo. They still do this today. The other end of the rope is held by several men who running turn the whole contraption around in circles. Torturously, these men are scattering herbs offered to their god Siva, a Hindu god, and swinging for like a quarter of an hour, screaming out and suffering in pain. He saw people committing the act of infanticide, killing their newborn children. He saw widows killing themselves when their husbands died to please their Hindu gods. William Carey's heart was broken for these people. I want to say to you, just because you're serving God doesn't mean it's always easy. 
Remember how his marriage started out with the loss of a child? Well, William Carey, after a few years in this first city, had to make a 300-mile journey to another city. And it was a three-week boat trip in the glaring hot sun, 110 degrees every single day. Soon, William Carey con contracted malaria. His five-year-old son, Peter, got a fever, got dysentery, and he died on the ride. It became too much for his wife, Dorothy, whose mental health began to deteriorate rapidly. She started to have delusions. She started to accuse William Carey of crazy things like committing adultery, and she even once threatened him with a knife. She had to be confined to a room and even physically restrained in a straitjacket. William Carey wrote, This is the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death for me, but I will rejoice that I am here notwithstanding because God is here. His friends begged him to commit her to an asylum, but he would not do that to his dear wife. He took care of her until December 18th, 1807, when she went home to be with the Lord. 26 years married, seven children. He made a journal entry that day. Mrs. Carey has died of fever, under which she languished for some time. Her death was a very easy one, because there was no appearance of returning reason, nor any dawn of hope or light on her state. He would marry two more times. His next wife died while serving God in India. His third wife died a year afterwards. He lost many things, multiple children and wives for the sake of the gospel. Now listen to this. For the first 18 months in India, William Carey got no mail. Because there's no email. There's no FedEx. There's no UPS, right? 18 months, no mail, no word back from home. And then when he finally got money, it wasn't enough. And when he finally got mail, guess what he got? He got a letter from a bunch of Baptists criticizing him for taking secular work to provide for his family. They said, we sent you there to preach the gospel only, not to take a side job. Well, he only had that job to provide for his family. When I read that, I could not help but weep to think how judgmental we are of people that give their all for the gospel. They give their all. Friends, after seven years of missionary labor, William Carey baptized his first convert. Seven years before one person was saved and baptized. A Hindu by the name of Krishna Pal. Krishna Pal not only became his first convert, he became a great, mighty preacher of the gospel for 20 years, the rest of his life. Krishna Pal became a pastor and an evangelist. He even wrote this hymn, O thou my soul, forget no more the friend who bore all thy misery. Let every idol be forgot, but O my soul, forget him not. William Carey uh, began to do a mighty work. He began to open up schools. He was translating the Bible in different languages. He was working in a church that they had started. He was doing all of this incredible work. I want you to hear his testimony. He said, when I, left India, when I left England, my hope of India's conversion was very strong. But there have been so many obstacles, it would have died unless it was upheld by God. I have God and His word is true. Though the superstitions of the heathen were a thousand times stronger than they are, the examples of the Europeans a thousand times worse. In other words, the English that were coming over there, they didn't make a good example of Jesus. Though I were deserted and persecuted by all, my faith is fixed on the sure word of God. And it will rise above all obstacles and it will cause overcome every trial and God's cause will triumph. As 2 Timothy 2 says, even though I am suffering, Paul says, and bound with chains, the word of God is not bound. God will be victorious even when we are weak and failing. So he gives his life to preaching, to sharing the gospel, to translating the Bible, to educating. Friends, he opens up this print shop. It's one of the first ones ever. He actually translates by 1797 the entire New Testament in Bengali. Now, friends, listen to this. Um, on March 11th, 1812, the print shop closed for the day. William Carey had just finished a dictionary, the first dictionary ever of the, that language in India. Okay? 
He had spent years working hard. Brothers and sisters, March 11th, 1812, a fire broke out in the print shop. His Greek, Hebrew, Oriental, and English types all caught on fire. The dictionary he had spent years compiling, burnt up in one night. All his work was gone. Translations of the scriptures in many languages, gone in one night. But here's the miracle. The next morning he goes in and guess what was not destroyed? The Indian types were kept safe in the fire. The types that he came there to do to spread the gospel in their languages were preserved. He said, in one short evening, the labor of years are consumed. How unsearchable are the ways of God. But the Lord has laid me low that I may look more simply to him. For the next 28 years, William Carey will see 4,000 converted to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. He will see six full Bibles translated into the language of the Indian people. 29 Bibles partially translated into different languages. He will see the abolition of infanticide. He will see the stopping of the burning of widows called sati by his efforts of preaching the gospel. He will see the caste system crushed in many places. You see, when William Carey shared the gospel, he explained to them the Hindu caste system was wrong. There is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, bond or slave, slave or free, male or female. We are one in Christ. He didn't make people become Westerners when they got saved. Think his first convert, Krishna Pal, the name of a Hindu god. Yet Krishna Pal became a mighty evangelist. He took the culture of India and he redeemed it for God and his glory. He loved these people. He didn't make them become like him. He made them become like Christ. After 41 years... William Carey was about to die. A Mr. Duff came to record William Carey's story. Carey was bound to a chair, fixed onto a board with four wheels to get around. Fever had taken away all of his strength. When Mr. Duff was about to leave, William Carey said, Mr. Duff, you have been talking too much of Dr. Carey. When I am gone, say nothing more about Carey. Speak instead of Carey's Savior. By June 9, 1834, the missionary reached the end of his mission. When he died, in his hands was the Bengali New Testament. He was reading this Bible in this language he had learned as he went to be with the Lord. This is what he asked to be written on his tomb. Born August 17, 1761, died June 9, 1834. A wretched, poor, and helpless worm. Or in thy kind arms, I fall. I believe this was the success of William Carey. He daily fell into the arms of Jesus. And you can't do this on your own. You can't live the Christian life on your own. But if you have Jesus, you can fall into his arms every day. And on that day, that last day, he fell into the arms of Christ. And to Christ's strength for God's glory. He left a college that he started there. He left schools there. He left the Bible in multiple languages there. He left a living church in a very hostile nation. William Carey said these words, the last words I leave you with. What is there in the earth worth living for but the glory of God and the salvation of souls? Friends, the world is coming to us. I believe that God might be calling some of you kids to go to the world. Maybe some of you adults to leave this city and go somewhere else to share the gospel, to plant a church. But I want to say to you that as Americans, we are uniquely privileged to have the world coming to us. Are we faithful? What on earth is there worth living for more than the glory of God and the salvation of souls? Let's bow before the Lord in prayer.